Uh, welcome everyone to the, the continued uh, informatic speaker series as, as we kind of alternate in between virtual and, and in-person versions. Uh, this week, I'm really thrilled that we have Erica Poole and Joe Fish K from Anthem AI. Uh, Erica Poole is the director of UX research, and Joe Fish K is the senior director of uh, interaction design and AI. Uh, they they both have a long history in the HCI space and and in in healthcare work. Uh, Joe Fish has his has his PhD from Cornell, and he has a long history in, in a whole bunch of different Silicon Valley companies, including Nokia and, and Yahoo and Mozilla. Uh, Erica Poole's PhD is from Georgia Tech, and she has a long history in, in doing work in the healthcare field. And it's it's really an honor to to have them here to uh, tell us a little bit more about what's going on within Anthem and share, share their perspectives. So thank you both. Awesome. Well, thank you, because this is a really a delight to be here. We can skip past our, our quick introductions because you've just done that for us. Thank you, thank you, thank you. So it is a delight to be here. And today our talk will be kind of in four different directions. We'll start with the story of diabetes and precision medicine and AI applications, and then we'll give you the I don't know, like VH1 behind the music uh, story of uh, what we thought we were doing and what it actually turned out we were doing. And we will give you some big, meaty, interdisciplinary questions to just mm, grab onto them. And we hope you'll take the torch and do some amazing research as a result. There's some juicy stuff here. So with all that, we're going to talk about diabetes, and that's our case study for today. So you've probably heard some of this stuff before. Diabetes is really common. It's really costly. It's not really fun to have. Uh, there are millions of Americans with diabetes. It's really, really expensive. Um, most people don't realize that they're on the arc of being at risk of diabetes until it's maybe a little bit late. Uh, if you have diabetes, you're at higher risk for all kinds of stuff, blindness, kidney failure, heart disease, stroke, amputation, premature death. I kind of sound like I'm in one of those like drug commercials, right? Like all those things, it, it sounds bad. And at the same time, diabetes patients, um, they can have stigma and distress because in many cases with type two diabetes, it's seen as a lifestyle disease. It's seen as something that is their fault uh, in some cases. So. The short of it, diabetes is not very fun, right? Um, it's a big issue. And it turns out that many patients aren't on the right medications. So some of our data science colleagues at Anthem uh, were involved in a pretty long study looking at a nationwide cohort of patients with diabetes who had HbA1c greater than 9%. If you've never heard of HbA1c, uh, what you need to know about it, this is a, it's a lab measure that basically shows like, how's your blood sugar been doing over the past three or so months? And if it's under 5.6, it means you're not diabetic. If it's over six and a half, you're diabetic. And if you're in the 9% range, you are probably really having some struggles with managing your diabetes. So for patients who are in this scenario, less than 2% of them are on optimized treatments. And it turns out if you watch these patients over time and they have treatment switches, the treatment switches are just as likely to make the patients uh, do worse rather than better. So the, the current state for patients who are struggling with diabetes control, it's not that great. And there's a lot of opportunity to do better. So, where did we end up with? Uh, we'll tell you today a little bit about an AI system called Precision Insights. And what it does is it gives prescribers information based on looking at um, some pretty large data sets of people with diabetes, information about how a patient might respond to alternative treatment combinations. So we know they're on a certain drug right now based on info about other patients, uh, what what other combinations might we recommend to get their A1C levels into a better area of control? 
This is where I wish I could say, wow, we solved the problem. It's amazing. We changed the world. Heck yeah, we're going to go home. We're going to retire. Our work here is done. Um, but it turns out it's, it's a little more complex than it first seems. So I'll show you the story first of what we thought we were doing when we uh, started working on this about a year ago, and then what we actually ended up with. Get ready, we're in for a ride here. So I'm gonna show you where uh, our data scientists started out with. So they have these AI models. They, uh, what they will generate is um, an output that looks like this. It's pretty complex, right? This shows a lot of stuff. It's not very glanceable. The problem we thought we were solving is how do you take what's here on this page and present it in a way that doctors can understand it and use it? And how do we fit this into the workflow in ways that make sense to them and are useful? And really, like we thought we were solving maybe a, an InfoViz problem. So maybe we were, maybe we weren't. But what's going on here? This is to uh, tell you a little bit about the model. So this comes out of the Precision Insights work. This is data that's based on people who have HbA1c higher than 9%, not very well controlled diabetes. And what this graph shows is how much you would expect their A1c to change by the next time they're due for a blood draw. So that's probably like three to six months from now. At the bottom, highlighted in yellow, that is where we would expect the, uh, this particular patient to be if they took metformin. So metformin is, it's a really common diabetes medication, super, super cheap, safe, it's effective, used a lot as a first line treatment, but depending on the patient, sometimes it might not work well enough. And also patients might not wanna take it either. It can, um, it can have some, quite frankly, really embarrassing GI side effects for some people. Like you probably don't wanna leave your house. Uh, it can also lead to uh, vitamin B12 deficiency. Like there's some, it might, you might not feel good taking it and you might not wanna take it. And if you do take it, it might not work well enough for some, for some people. So what this model does is it shows, okay, well, how much can we expect A1C to change? If maybe we just, move things around a bit, what will happen? And if I could actually click on the next slide. So what we see here is the best possible choice for this patient would be if we took metformin plus an SGLT2 inhibitor plus another drug that I cannot say the name of and I'm not even gonna try to butcher it here. Put those three drugs together, this patient is gonna do uh, remarkably better than they would if they were just taking metformin but maybe we don't wanna go that advanced. Okay, what are some other things we could do? Maybe we can mix metformin and an SGLT2 inhibitor or metformin plus just a GLP-1 medication. You're gonna get some pretty good bang for the buck here. And you can see here, there's like a bunch of other combinations of things that you could do, combining metformin with other drugs or just switching things all together. Super cool, right? So this is where we start. The problem we think we have is how do we show this information to doctors in a way that's meaningful, that's believable, that helps them take the best care of their patients. And it turns out that what we thought was like the UX research, you know, you always see like UX researchers, we work in post-it notes and we put post-it notes up on walls and then we solve problems and we change the world. That's what we thought we were doing. The reality turned out a little bit different. And we'll tell you about the research that we did that, um, in some ways changed our thinking and uh, expanded our horizons on what we thought we were doing. So we did some user research with clinicians and this was during the pandemic. So of course we're doing it over Zoom, right? We did uh, exploratory research where we were working with clinicians, uh, learning more about their clinical workflow, about how they think about prescribing, how they do treatment decision-making. And we showed them some mock-ups of different concepts of how we might visualize the data, of how we might incorporate things into different points of their workflow and use that to, um, to guide product decisions for the Precision Insights product. And over the course of several months, we worked with about 40 medication prescribers. They were from all over the US, different practice sizes, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Pretty wide group of um, prescribers. And I'm just gonna show you a little bit of how uh, the type of work that we were doing so you can get a flavor of the type of things that go on in our day-to-day. -day and um, 
that will show you what we found. So through we had all kinds of design concepts that we were uh, bringing forth to clinicians. And these are all things like nothing here is ever going to see the light of day. But these were mock-ups where we could use them to work through possibilities, understand what was working well, what wasn't. Uh, for example, one area that was a bit of a surprise to us is one of the things that clinicians really, really, really valued was info about pricing for drugs and how much is the out-of-pocket uh, cost to patients. Doesn't have anything to do with A1C, for example, but it turned out patient or excuse me, physicians um, really need that info. And in many cases, the data feeds that they have for that info aren't that good in practice. So uh, as you can see, there were many, many, many different things that we we're looking at, different ways of displaying the info, different ways of um, having data represented visually, what kinds of supplemental info, where would we put it in the workflow? Would we want to have something patient facing? Would you not want to have it patient facing? Um, those were all uh, questions that we pondered over that period of time. And the way that we worked is we iterated on ideas quickly. We would have you know, maybe a couple of runs with doctors where we're showing them some concepts. Okay, quickly, 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 work with the designer, change things up, bring some other concepts in front of doctors. And from there, um, you know, the, the cost of changing things up was um, pretty low because we're working with prototyping software, low fidelity mockups. It's uh, just a matter of testing out ideas. We also spent quite a bit of time in our interviews just talking with physicians about what does their work look like? Uh, and what's a day in the life of primary care? Where would AI tools fit in? And we had this assumption that physicians, that they would want to explore. They'd really want to understand uh, what was happening underneath the hood of the data so they could trust it. However, there's this conflict that we found and, and a physician just very bluntly told us the point of care is for deciding, not exploring. So we were building all these you know, very complex interfaces, but at the same time, there's this conflict of in a patient care scenario, there's a limited amount of information that they're able to handle at one particular point in time. So fit into workflow can be a little bit tricky. Uh, I won't talk too much about that though. Let's turn to how do doctors make type two diabetes treatment decisions. This is an area where things are gonna get a little bit spicy here. So to get there, I have to tell you a little bit about clinical guidelines. Um, and for any medical colleague watching this, like this is where I apologize in advance because I'm not that kind of doctor. So type two diabetes treatment decisions. This is where, um, our assumptions about what we were working on really, um, we realized we were not necessarily working on an info viz problem. We weren't necessarily working on a where does it fit in the workflow problem, but that there's something bigger going on. So when physicians are making decisions about treatment, one of the things that they use are clinical guidelines. And clinical guidelines, these are, um, Recommendations that are based on evidence from systematic reviews, synthesis, the public published medical literature. On the screen, you can see a treatment pathway clinical guidelines for um, this is for diabetes. It's from the American Diabetes Association. Now, if you look at this, you might like walk away with the idea of, oh, these things like medicine is a cookbook. You just follow the little path and then there you go. That's exactly how you do it. Um, they're not fixed protocols. They aren't something where you follow the recipe and that's how medicine is practiced. In reality, medicine is highly situationally dependent. There's many individualized patient factors. Um, there's a lot of expertise and discretion that has to happen in order to make a decision about diabetes treatments. But doctors do lean on clinical guidelines quite a bit. And it's a very important part of how medical decision-making happens. So there's this tension between the clinical guidelines and what the guidelines say and what the studies say versus what might actually come up in practice for a patient. And when we talk to physicians about how do you decide what medications to, uh, for diabetes, they'd say, well, metformin, we start with metformin and then 
and then the it, what they were interested in was not necessarily a1c control there are many 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 considerations drug costs patient preferences and patient fears particularly around injectable medications there's many scenarios where patients are afraid of needles they don't want to go to a more effective medication treatment burden sometimes there's just too much for a patient to do and it's not it might be the best medication on paper but in practice it might be really tricky for them to be able to handle that medication regime. You also have issues around secondary benefits. And what's meant by that is a good example in diabetes medication specifically, I believe it's GLP ones, but it could be mistaken. Um, they also are used as weight loss drugs. So for patients who might also be struggling with weight loss, that is a potential secondary benefit. There's also some drugs that can have cardiovascular benefits so sometimes physicians will have a preference there if they know a patient has some, um, some other issues going on. And of course, they will say, we use what the clinical guidelines say, but also just some intuition based on what they've seen before um, and constraints, time constraints. Uh, we had physicians tell us, I don't have time to teach patients how to do this. I don't have to, like injection, for example, I don't have time to answer all of these questions. So I just go with such and such a thing. And maybe that's not the most um, heartening thing to hear, but that is that is a reality in inpatient care sometimes. Uh, there's also constraints on formulary, on what pay, uh, what insurance will cover, what how much it will cost, whether there are certain steps that have to be taken before a medication will be eligible, and that can limit um, what is chosen. And also, um, if you noticed a system like Precision Insights recommends a bunch of changes at once, um, typically physicians are a little bit reluctant to make a bunch of simultaneous changes. And if any of you are experimental design folks, this makes complete sense, right? If you change a bunch of variables all at once, you have no idea what caused what. So by changing one thing at a time, it's you know a little bit easier. So, they're kind of using clinical guidelines, but they're also thinking of all these uh, patient specific factors. And if we go back to thinking about how clinical guidelines are made. So clinical guidelines are all about having systematic evidence from clinical trials, but there's a bit of a problem when you look at um, clinical trials and using evidence that's based on clinical trials. So clinical trials are how do they work? So you have a small number of people, they're either given a drug or a placebo, effects are compared. Uh, typically study populations that sign up for clinical trials tend to not be as diverse as the general population um, in a range of ways. It can be gender, ethnicity, it could be comorbidities, et cetera, et cetera. And in diabetes specifically, uh, there's been some research showing that um, the people who are in diabetes clinical trials do not necessarily match where there is uh, more diabetes in the population. And it turns out there are some differences in drug outcomes based on ethnic groups. So what the clinical trials tell us and what might actually happen in practice may not be aligned with one another. So it sounds like, okay, so wouldn't this be a really cool place for AI, right? And if you look at Precision Insights, the system that we were working on, how did it work? So it's the system for recommending treatments. It takes all this data from, um, well, from a certain insurance company, and it looks at um, what patients are similar to a particular patient on a number of variables. So it will match patients on A1C level, age, comorbidities, history of insulin use, and find patients who are kind of like a digital twin to the patient in question. So this gives you a different way to, uh, to look at what medications might be appropriate. Rather than using the clinical trial data, it uses real world evidence, helps you account for things like adherence and non-compliance and drug interactions in a way that is you know, a little bit beyond what's possible with clinical trials. However, 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 physicians in, in the study that we did, they were reluctant to embrace this new way of thinking. 
particularly because it deviated from clinical guidelines. And they were still reluctant, even in situations where they agreed it might be based on better data than what they use now. So you might ask, what in the world is going on here? This is where it starts to get really juicy. And this is where I'm gonna tag team over to uh, Dr. K here to uh, blow our minds with um, philosophy of science. Thank you. Um... What a superb setup there. Um, so yeah, I want to complicate this whole story in a way that I wouldn't do for most audiences. And in particular, this is one of the reasons I'm excited to give this talk to this particular audience, um, to the informatics program, because I think it's the right audience for this talk, right? And for the sort of discussions that we're doing. Um, and I wanna talk about sort of the epistemological underpinnings of knowledge. And by that, I specifically mean the marks of quality that people use to know whether a particular, um, whether something is good or not. Should I pay attention to this or not? And if you look at the studies that are going on right now within, uh, within AI, for example, you can see a domain, an area that has realized that some of its epistemological underpinnings have had to change over the last couple of years because they weren't thinking in the ways that need, they need to be thinking about questions like bias, right? And representation and things like that. Um, and so what I wanna walk you through is uh, what we think is going on in some ways around these representations of knowledge and how people are thinking about marks of quality, and then talk about what the implications are for an education in, in relative epistemological, in relative epistemology. Um, next slide, please, Erica. Um, my undergrad was in brain and cognitive science um, in a place that was so recently called the Department of Psychology that you could still find letterhead like lying around the old building, um, which said Department of Psychology at the top. Um, and there was always a certain pleasure when you found that, right? And uh, I was taught sort of at some point in the class, one of the questions was, well, how many, you know, how many people do we need to do in a study? And I was told that pretty much you need about 30. And they did some math up on the, on the, on the it's probably still a blackboard back then, because um, I'm older than dirt. And, uh, and we were told that pretty much for any like study in psychology, brain and cognitive science, you, you usually needed 30 people, right? And obviously if you have more conditions, you have more, but we needed about 30. Um, and that was a pretty good rule of thumb. But then of course, what nobody ever said was, uh, it was never phrased as this is what you need for a study in cognitive science. It said for a good study, this is what you need to do. And I think that's the fundamental thing that, that, that it made me realize is that we're very rarely taught these heuristics for quality in a relative way. We are taught them as canon, right? We are taught them that, you know, this is the right way to do it, right? And they're often easier to see in other people's fields than they are in our own fields, right? You talk to anthropologists, you're like, well, how do you know when you've done a good study? Um, and they, they'll sort of tell these sort of half jokey answers, right? About, well, you know, you need to be in a mud hut and if, you know, you didn't get dysentery, then you weren't doing it right. And there's, you know, and, you know, nobody would suggest that that's the mark of the true mark of quality, but there isn't, when you are engaging with anthropologists say, there are a set of values by which anthropologists articulate what makes this. One of my favorite papers um, is by Little, I think it is, um, and it's called, uh, oh, I should have dug it up, I'm so sorry. I believe it's called um, Marks of Quality and the, What Makes a Good Ethnography, um, and it talks about sort of what are the qualities of that paper that you expect when to get, um, when, you, when, you get an, uh, uh, when you get an ethnography. Next slide, please. Um, we see this articulated in some ways in some of the work in our own field, um, so I wanted to um, figure out, I, I wanted to find a nice example from Kai that I can particularly pick on because like having spent a lot of my time, you know, I'm like, this is like picking on my own stuff, right? Even though I didn't actually write this particular text. Um, but again, we have these marks of quality around, and the number of people in a trial, in, in a study is only one thing, right? Like, like that's not the only mark of quality but it is one that is familiar to people within the field that you can talk about. This is the number of people. And that's true in other cases, right? Um, 
And when we go to new fields and new disciplines, they have other marks of quality um, about, you know, if you talk to information retrieval, then they will say, well, you know, pretty much you sort of want to get some precision like this and some recall like this. Um, and often from outside, it's not always clear what those marks of quality are, but as you come in, you start to understand them. Um, that's obviously true in healthcare as well. Can you go to the next slide, please? Um, this is taken from the American Health American Heart Association guidelines. Um, and it's a summary of, uh, this is the decision-making tool that people use right now to, um, to make decisions around what should you be doing with people who have say high cholesterol or um, high lipidemia. Okay, well, if you've got an LDLC of above 190 then, and they're above the age of 21, then they should go on a high intensity statin. And if not, then this other thing. Um, and these are ways to articulate peer-reviewed studies of usually randomized controlled trials um, and articulate them in guideline form, right? So that they, they're literally like handy dandy little like um, things that you can sort of buy for five bucks from the American Heart Association. So you can keep it in your pocket and say, ah, oh, well, we should put you on uh, a moderate intensity statin, right? Like that's the answer. That's what we should be doing. But these are the marks of quality that people expect. And in particular, when you are presenting information to doctors, there are two key marks of quality people are looking for. The first is that there is um, a randomized control trial published in a journal that they like. Um, that journal should be, uh, like if you're talking to British doctors, they want it to be published in BMJ or The Lancet. Um, if you're talking to uh, endocrinologists, they'd like to see a paper published in the Journal of Endocrinology. Um, I made that one up. I think there's a journal of endocrinology. I've been meaning to look it up for like months now. Um, but I, that idea that it's published in a reputable journal. In particular, I'd like to point out that if you're like, here's this Kai paper, they don't care, right? Um, there's sort of big, you know, stuff in the middle. They'll be like, well, there's a nature paper that kind of counts for something, right? Um, but there is, but you want to see that. And in particular, it should be a randomized controlled trial because they have been told throughout their education that randomized controlled trials are the right way to create knowledge in the world, right? And even if we're creating knowledge in other ways that are better by their standards of quality, um, they still wanna see a randomized controlled trial. And the second thing is, of course, they want a guideline, something that looks like this there, this here. And the, because the guidelines are understood to be the distilled essence of those results of randomized controlled trials. So one of the things that we ended up doing, and this goes back to Erica's point about treating this as an information visualization exercise, was how do we end up representing our data in a way that we can communicate with clinicians across the epistemological boundaries that we find ourselves, right? Um, so I'm gonna show you five of these. Um, I think I hold these lightly, right? I think they are useful tools and they contribute to uh, the discourse around things like sustainable, sorry, about um, transparent AI, right? About legibility in AI results and things like that. But they're also very much within this context of us trying to communicate to physicians and putting things in front of them. So I think they are very light. And to be honest, I think they're almost the fluffiest bit of this, um, of, of this talk, but I'm gonna show them because I think they, they articulate some of the things we're doing. So the first one uh, is this graph that you saw earlier. Um, and I like this because this was created by the uh, data science people. And for them, it is such a compelling way to display information. And you know, sort of when people sort of show you something that they're very proud of, um, and you're like, I need to understand why they are very proud of this. And it contains a lot of information. Um, so it's saying that the baseline there is, is down the bottom. You can see that line that says METF. Um, and we had, the, the, we had 9,164 patients who were only on metformin. And so that's the baseline, right? Everything else is compared to what would happen if you took straight up metformin. Um, all of the, there's, there's another half of this slide that we couldn't fit, of this page that we couldn't fit on this slide, which is all of the things that are worse than taking straight up metformin, right? So you're seeing all the things that are better than taking straight up metformin. Um, and you can see that there are different treatment sizes here. So some of these, metformin plus an SGLT2 inhibitor, 
we've got about what a thousand and thirty nine people there who have taken that. So that we're pretty strong. Um, that that's a pretty solid answer. Um, our best case scenario there, the metformin plus SGLT2 inhibitors plus TZD, and like Erica, I have never figured out how to pronounce that word. Um, uh, N equals 63 there, so it's a lot smaller. So it's displaying this information. It is displaying this mark of quality of these are the number of people. And when you go through and you read the paper, they did a super good job. They actually took issues of bias and representation and making sure that the sampling was doing the right kind of thing seriously. Um, so they're trying to represent uh, this data in a way that is epistemologically complete. I will assure you that doctors cannot read this slide. Like we've sat there and we've spent time, and yes, you know, I can walk through because they're obviously intelligent people with great backgrounds, right? But like this is not an intuitive form for them. Um, but this is an attempt, a failed attempt, perhaps, to communicate with with clinicians across the epistemological boundary. Next slide, please. Um, a better example is, uh, this is called a Shapley plot. It's a way to represent the data that went into a decision. So this is a different project. This one is called Total Health Score, except I feel that name got changed at some point recently. Um, so it basically says, this is the probability of hospital admission for this particular patient. It's over a very long period, which makes it not very useful. It's something the original version was two years, and I think we eventually cut it back to six months or something. So uh, for this particular patient of, of that age with their com comorbidities, um, a normal person, normal patient at that age would have a baseline risk of 12%. So 12% of patients, let's say um, that 12% of those patients would go into hospital at some point in the next six months. This particular one, because they've also got complicated diabetes, and because they also have chronic uncomplicated HDN, and they've also got obesity, plus some other stuff, which has smaller effects, but all adds up to another 5% or so, they're actually at 29% chance of going into hospital. And you can see how this is a pretty legible um, slide. It's nothing exciting, but it does convey the information, hey, this patient is likely to be admitted to hospital sometime soon. Next slide, please. Um, this one, again, I feel is very low-hanging fruit, but you'd be amazed how many times people get this wrong. Um, here is a patient with, uh, actually, as it happens, this graph is not particularly high blood pressure. Let's pretend this graph had, had high blood pressure on. Um, a lot of clinical support systems say things like, this patient has high blood pressure. We recommend a beta blocker. Um, this is absolutely obvious, right? Every doctor knows this. So by telling them that, you're not actually telling them anything useful. Um, you're, not, you're not showing anything they don't know. So the challenge to us becomes, how can we create value by the ways that we are showing this information? So they don't know that, say, some percentage of patient doctors prescribed a beta blocker. It may be that number is 98, but it may be that number is 27, or maybe that number is 55, and each of those are different cases. So that's actually telling useful information. Um, if we can do the precision insights thing here and say, actually, um, we've got some data on N thousand patients, which suggests that ACE inhibitors work better than beta blockers um, on similar patients, um, then, then that's actually a useful piece of information, unlike we recommend a beta blocker. Um, I should be clear, by the way, I have no idea whether ACE inhibitors are better than beta blockers. Um, I made that up because it sounded like sort of medical language. Um, one of these days, I've got to check with the doctor and see. Um, so don't stop taking beta blockers and start taking ACE inhibitors because I said so. Next slide, please. Um, obvious other things that we can do. Because we have data, we can predict the future, right? And to me, this is the big change that we're seeing uh, in medicine, is how do you articulate the fact that we've got a data-driven background that was used to uh, predict the future? So you can see on the left-hand side, um, I don't love either of these visualizations particularly, but they were the two that we had lying around. Um, the one on the left, you can see how this particular patient um, had not great uh, cholesterol, started taking resuvastatin, um, which is Crestor, right? Um, and you can see it was really pretty effective. And the hope is that the, that the next time we'll see these, these uh, cholesterol levels start to get better. And that's that dashed line at the end. Um, on the right, it's going back to the metformin and the diabetes case. 
can we take two particular examples? If you're on straight metformin, chances are your HbA1c after three months will be somewhere in that range of that blue fan. But if you go on TZD instead, and there's that word. No, I'm not going to try. I'm not going to. I'm not going to embarrass myself by trying to do this on a public Zoom call of trying to read that word there. Um, uh, then you're going to be in the red fan area, right? And again, you're trying to sort of show both the probability and the uncertainty there. Next slide, please. The other rule of uh, heuristic that we came up with is this idea of respecting the workflow, right? Um, and again, this sounds really obvious. Um, I know that Kai's done work on this. I know that Yunen's done work on this. I'm pretty sure Elena's done work. I think most of you, I mean, I, I would put money that half the people on this call have a paper with the word workflow somewhere in the title. Um, and yet we keep running into this problem where people say, oh, we have solved this problem. And you're like, well, how does it fit into the workflow? And they're like, the what? So um, this is something that came out of Erica's group and Erica showed it earlier. And I love this because it, it really articulates, this is sort of the complexity of, of what a doctor's workflow looks like. Um, and how you actually uh, end up engaging. And this is the complexity of the situation that any tool we're building is within. Okay. Um, I th want to say one more time, I think that those examples there, that they're uh, discontinuous. They're not all the same categories of information. Um, they are tools for engaging across this epistemological domain. Um, they're sort of the boundary objects. Um, if that lets us engage with these uh, with these data um, and with these recommendations. Um, through our different understandings of quality right. And this is where I want your expert advice and attention and opinions. Um, because you have a lot of expertise in this. And I think the nature of the informatics department is a place in which you can have this discussion about relative epistemology. Um, because you can say, ah, this is what cognitive scientists believe around how many people should be in a study. And this is what people at CHI say. And this is what anthropologists say. And you can give people, you can empower students with this ability to recognize what are these marks of quality that are important to the domain that they identify with? And what are the other ones? And one of the things that comes out of that and why it matters is you go off to industry or you go off anywhere else really, but you go off to industry and you are talking to people who do not share the same set of values as you. You do not talk to, you talk to people and they don't understand what makes a good study. Your part of your work is to educate people and say, hey, here's this thing you need to understand um, about how knowledge is created. Um, and you don't use words like epistemology because that will scare people off like from miles off because it's a really long word and everyone feels they should know what it means and they don't quite. And maybe it's got something to do with insects or is that the other one, right? Um, but your need to communicate to people and engage with people across epistemological boundaries is consistent. And you need to be able to recognize, ah, I am talking to a data scientist they are making these assumptions about the, the, the marks of quality. And that is why they are dismissing this work that, that is coming from my point of view um, as a ethnographer say, right? And so, or conversely, you're dealing with people who have a lot of experience with ethnographers um, and you're trying to say, well, we should look at these click patterns on this page because clearly everybody is just looking at the top left-hand side and nobody is looking at this information we've placed over there on the right and realize, ah, you don't think in that way. And so I think there's a sort of, there's a communicative element to this in which being able to articulate and be aware of these different epistemological assumptions around the nature of information and what makes good information um, becomes part of your job and becomes part of the way to be effective, to communicate and to have the impact that you want to have, whatever that impact may be. And, to me, this is the sort of thing that interdisciplinary departments have an opportunity to do that you don't see when you're in a, a department that has a single focus, right? I love the fact that I, the work that I'm seeing come out of places um, like Irvine's Informatics, like um, HCDE at uh, UW. Did I get that wrong? I usually get that acronym wrong. Um, like the Cornell Information Science School. Um, like you're seeing these places in which 
interdisciplinary, uh, people are working interdisciplinary, like in this really hands-on way. That's not just like, oh, well, we put two people together and saw what happens, but embracing the fact that people are articulating their sense of values and their sense of what constitutes quality and information um, in the very ways that they're doing their work on a day-to-day -day basis. So it is an inspiration. It is super exciting um, uh, to, to be able to talk to all of you about this. Um, thank you for coming. And I would love your expert advice and your thoughts on where we can take this next. Thank you. Thank you, Erica and Jofesh. So uh, we have, that, that was a, a very uh, thought provoking conclusion. So uh, I, I hope that we can have some good discussion based off of this. Uh, go ahead and, and maybe let's, let's use the Zoom feature for hand raising. Uh, if people have questions that they want to ask, uh, go ahead and, uh, and start with Madhu and then Nick will be next. Hey, Joe Fish, thank you for that talk. It was really interesting. And I think it's, uh, you know, as long as we've been working in informatics, we still run into the same problems, it seems, which is telling developers, this is great, but have you thought about the human aspects? Um, and so as you kind of run into these problems, how do you communicate that back? How do you kind of say, oh, this is a great visualization or this is useful, but you know, doc, clinicians are not physicians are going to sit there and try to figure this out. Um, or it doesn't fit into, yes, the workflows or work practices. I'm just kind of curious about how things have evolved. Because when I started doing this stuff 20 years ago, it was the same problem. It sounds like we're still dealing with the same problem. Um, so uh, any thoughts on how you guys are trying to push back on that and try to get them to think broader? So I think that that is the question, right? Like that is the question that essentially Eric and I have spent the last year of our, of our careers working on. Um, I would say that one aspect of this is if you can find an X, a value around which you can align, then you can move something forward. If you can say, well, we really want to make sure that we improve the health of um, uh, prima very uh, first time mothers, right? And you've got somebody who really cares about the health of, of first time mothers, maybe for their own reasons, right? Um, then that's a thing that you can use and say, and therefore I think we should do this. But I feel like when you try and use the evidence of the thing itself, because of this gap in the epistemological understandings, um, you end up going around in circles a lot. And so you've got to do it. You've got to go through that process in the first case. But I feel that you also end up not being able to, you end up looking for other opportunities to find reasons why they should care about this um, and why they should listen to you because you really are right. Um, but it's, I wish I had a nice easy answer that I was like, why yes, you, you just use the magic formula, left, left, right, right? Like, um, Erica, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, so I, I'd say, Something else that can help is to invite your technical colleagues to be, I don't know, uh, partners in crime and in discovery. Like they have questions and curiosities too. And if you can tap into that and take the time to listen to like, well, what is it that you're curious about? Because it turns out engineers actually are pretty curious about like, how do doctors do their jobs? And where do I put this thing? And, and they're working off of incomplete information and often have to deliver something because that's, you know, they're left holding the bag if they don't do it. But the questions are there. And if you take the time to engage and, and you know, draw out what they're interested in, sometimes you like, then, then they're more bought into it. It doesn't work all the time, but um, it's maybe more possible than, than it sounds. Go ahead, Nick. Great. Thank you guys so much again. Um, I have a quick questions. Thank you, Erica, for um, doing such a great job unpacking all the breakdowns in realizing AI and the promise of data driven um, in healthcare. I wonder, have you, um, in your research, have you attempted to, or have you found any um, infrastructure work that the clinicians have to carry out to repair the existing healthcare system or repair the promises of data driven or AI? Um, to be actually working the workflow. Hopefully that makes sense. <laughs> okay, I will say 
Uh, I'm not sure if I can answer your question fully. The one thing that comes to mind for me is in a year of speaking with you no know, close to 200 physicians, we there was only one who had even used an AI system. And it was when he was in a position where there was a patient with mystery symptoms and he had run out of ideas. And that was like his last resort. He's like, well, I guess I'll try this thing and maybe I'll get an answer which is um, probably not the answer you were looking for, but um, that's about where I am at close to 5 p.m. on a Friday here in central time zone. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, Emery, go for it. Uh, thank you, Erica. Thank you, Joe Fish. Um, it was wonderful hearing the talk. I think it's, there are two things that were occurring to me as you're talking. One, that there seems to be like, um, well, first off, I thought the punchline of like, why were these clinicians not using these tools was going to be like, oh, because they have to have randomized trials because otherwise they're going to get sued if they use their like other topics for basis of their decisions. Uh, I thought that was interesting, just like the layer of like assumptions or like risk aversion that are maybe going on behind the scenes. Um, and then also I thought there's a kind of like informational problem to even the epistemological problem, right? Where like in order to understand how to meet someone at their epistemological starting point, you have to know what their basic point of view is. And when you're meeting with someone, you know, you, kn you know about the UCI informatics program because you know about us. But if you're meeting with someone in industry, you don't necessarily know what their background is. You don't necessarily know where they're coming at the problem from. So how do you even get to that first level of information of just kind of like knowing who you're even speaking to and who your audience is? So there's, if you're doing user research, a really good question you can ask is, what is credible to your boss or what is credible to your stakeholders? And even if they're not speaking about themselves, like you get a pretty clear answer of, oh, the people in, you know, involved with these decisions, like they only care about this type of evidence or that type, like there was, there's willingness to show that, but Joe, Joe Fish probably has a much, um, a much more in-depth answer. Um, so yes and, right? Uh, you have two great tools. Um, available to you. One is the org chart uh, for your company. And I would say nearly every meeting I go to, I look people up on the org chart to figure out what they're doing. Um, at Yahoo for a while, we had a lovely policy, which was that you had to put your goals for the year, like your, your org scale goals for the year into your um, profile um, so that you could look someone up. And even more important to Erica's point, you would go and look up the person and then you go and look up their boss's goals, right? And then you would tell a story about how your understanding contributed to solving their boss's goals, right? Um, and that was sort of, they're like, ah, this does matter because it gets to whatever that thing is. Um, the other thing, you, I definitely find I look people up on LinkedIn, right? Uh, and say, well, oh, okay, they've got a background, they've got, you know, two degrees in economics and then another one in like, you know, they've picked up an accountancy degree somewhere in there. This is probably not going to be someone that if I tell like a deep, meaningful story about, you know, one patient's experience, that's not going to be the most compelling person. And like, I feel slightly bad uh, making that assumption about people, right? That you can say, ah, here is this person who went to this particular experience in undergrad, which therefore shapes their entire lives. Um, it's one of the things that contributes. I don't like it as much as the being able to see what's um, uh, about, you know, what, what their goals actually are within the organization um, and what their boss is looking for. But it's, it's one of the tools that you have available that you're making sense out of, right? And, you know, partly we all make sense out of com complex signals and it's one of the complex signals. I'd also like to talk a little bit, your point earlier about, um, about getting sued one of the things that we really that we lent into at the beginning was how can you make this an authoritative source for making decisions? So if we are saying put this patient on these drugs, can we make it so that there is, you know, the, you, you can cut and paste the URL into the clinical notes to say, and this is what we decided to do. 
And I think that idea of um, it does have to be verifiable, right? Um, and it do, and I I suspect if we project forward ten years, there will be clinical guidelines that will incorporate AI driven decisions with reference to the process for making those AI driven decisions, right? It would say something like you know. Uh, and the American Health Re Association recommends that if you have a patient with hyperlipidemia like this, and there is an AI recommendation where there are uh, there is a study with at least n equals ten thousand people um, like this, like this that took into the the standard bias correction, blah 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 blah. Um, then that one is a validated suggestion. But we're not there yet, and we're not going to be for ten or fifteen years. And it would be interesting to think about what are the processes in a design fiction kind of way, what are the things that would have to happen for that to be true? Thank you so much, both of you. Melissa. Thank you both. That was fascinating. Hi, Joe Fish. Nice to meet you, Erica. Um, you know, what your last, what you just ended up actually perfectly segues into my question I had, which was, you know, in the management world, we have a old, fairly long history of studying boundary objects, and especially the way that they can help communities of practice engage in some of these really challenging questions that you're talking about. And boundary objects can be things like engineering plans and, and, and you know, actual visualizations of data. And there's some classic research from Beth Betchke on how you can get different occupational communities that center around a document and be able to actually communicate differently and understand each other's epistemological assumptions via the, these kind of representations of work and so forth. And I guess I'm just wondering from a kind of a HCI design perspective, especially those like you who are kind of working with clinicians kind of in real context, how much is that taken into account in a, that being what you're describing here? in the actual design of these visualizations and how they're kind of rolled out with the different communities? Or is that what you're just suggesting we need to do? In which case, yes. Say that one more time. I, I was following and then there was the word that and I got lost on what that was. <laughs> so I'm curious, I'm curious, that one more time? I'm curious in the work that you're doing, which is taking these kind of insights and trying to translate them in a way that these different communities of practice can actually engage with and trust as being valid and so forth. And doing some of that work of understanding where people are coming from and therefore how do they need to receive the information? How much does that actually plays into the way that the visualizations are designed? Like, I'm just curious, do you feel like that this is actually happening in practice or are you, is this a call to arms in this space? I mean, we are trying to do precisely that, right? We are trying to take into account those, uh, those issues in how we design this. Um, I think it turns out to be more, it, it's a more fundamental difference than that in that you know you can design the perfect visualization but we still run into this problem where the very information that's being being visualized is not considered to be uh, valid actionable data right um and so i think that's you know we re i mean we really did think it's an information design we thought it was an information design problem at the beginning and we really did realize it doesn't matter how perfect your information design is if people are rejecting the underlying nature of the data, right? Absolutely. And there's, an, and there's another layer to this too of like uh, pharmacists versus physicians too, mm. where, you know, as soon as you start to get something where the, the primary care doctors are like, aha, yes, okay, this is making sense. And then you show it to a pharmacist and you're like, no, well, actually, here's all the other things that are missed. So, I mean, it's, I think even within different medical specialties, you still, it's hard. This is really hard stuff. Yeah, it's really fascinating. I'd love to talk to you more about it. Gladly. Yes, love to do that. Um... Please. Uh, so while we wait to, to see if there are other questions, I'll ask one, uh, one of my questions. Um, so I, I really appreciated kind of the, uh, the call for uh, at, at, least, at least kind of being aware of all the other kind of socio-technical considerations that uh, providers and prescribers are, are thinking about when they're, they're kind of choosing 
uh, which have a couple of different kind of medication uh, uh, formulations to be considering. Um, and, and I guess like one question, and, and that kind of parallels some things that we've been seeing in, in, in some work that we've been doing also. Um, and, and I guess my question is like, kind of given that in light of that, to what extent should we be, you know, kind of taking a, a back seat with our suggestions in these sorts of interfaces that we're developing versus, you know, kind of uh, going really, really strong with, you know, we have all of this, these, you know, AI driven models that suggest these particular things, but, you know, are absent the socio-technical things like, you know, cost of, of uh, prescriptions and all that sort of stuff. Um, so like, should we, you know, should we lean on that? Should we not? Or is that just, you know, the question that we need to be thinking about more? I'd say if you could, well, this is the question you didn't ask, but I'm going to answer. Um, free research problem for somebody who wants it. If you could figure out a way to quantify treatment burden, I think there's so much value in that. And um, because that like quick to answer, uh, quick, quick numeric stuff. There might be some usefulness there, and it doesn't necessarily get in the way of like the doctor's expertise. Yeah. Yeah. It's 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 you know what you don't want to do is generate Clippy for doctors, right? It looks like you're trying to diagnose diabetes, right? Um, and how you can make something that is, I mean, it goes back to that early point about, you know, what you don't want to do is recommend a beta blocker when you've got high blood pressure, right? How do you respect those levels of expertise? And how do you, uh, how do you make them not hate you? Because this is the thing to realize is that most doctors hate most of the work they do every time, right? Like there are actual studies on this. EMRs reduce doctors' will to live, right? It is use of the EMR is highly correlated with like feeling dreadful and that's a pretty horrible work environment right like that's a really disturbing statistic and you know if we can find something where people can feel empowered um wow would I love it if we can make that happen right that was a either very optimistic or very pessimistic note to end on <laughs> I'm not sure which <laughs> uh anyone anyone else have a direction they want to take us in otherwise uh give it a couple more seconds all um, right well then go ahead i was just going to take advantage to plug um uh please do feel free to friend us on linkedin um both of us and uh, we will be hiring uh, user researchers and designers over the course of the year. We don't have any openings open right now, but we will have those. Um, so uh, we'll be in touch. And I think we have a plan to send it to, did we say, who did I take notes? Who am I supposed to send exciting things to? Um, Melissa? Griffith, yeah. You can send them to me for sure. I'll send them to 7,000 grad students if you send them to me, though. <laughs> so you might not also send here. them to me and I'll make sure they get in front of our grad students. All right. we'll, 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 send, we'll send them along appropriately and, and, and figure out the scale. So, um, Fantastic. Thank you all so much. That was great. Thank you for having us. <laughs> Likewise. Thank you. <laughs>